Ok. Boa noite a todos. Boa tarde a todos. Bem-vindo a train. So, welcome to everybody. That's my terrible attempt to speak Portuguese. Uh, Michael Asbury um, knows very well that my Portuguese is uh, atrocious. Um, but that was my attempt to introduce um, start of the evening, which is a first for us. One of, or I think it may well be, it's not a first, but it's a very unusual event for us, which we're very proud to do, which is a, uh, an event with simultaneous translation. So the event will be in Portuguese with simultaneous translation in English. And I'll explain in a second about how you can access that translation. So welcome to TRAIN, the Research Center for Transnational Arts, Identity and Nation, based at the University of the Arts in London. TRAIN, as a research center, investigates historical, theoretical, and practice-based research in art, architecture, design, um, and research. And what we do collectively is to critique dominant ideas about globalization and to open up new perspectives that address how questions of art and design can respond to social injustice, decolonization of institutions, and the creation of more diverse global art histories. And we have a number of researchers across many fields from design to contemporary art, to curation, to um, art practice that address these fields across a global spectrum. This evening's event will be uh, moderated um, and curated by Dr. Michael Asbury, who is a, a reader in the history and theory of um, art at University of the Arts London, and also deputy director of TRAIN. So Michael, uh, sorry, before I hand over to Michael, let me quickly um, just take you through um, the housekeeping for this evening. So we have simultaneous interpretation available. So please click on the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and choose English. If you wish to hear only the interpreter's voice without the original Portuguese audio in the background, then you choose the option mute original audio. Okay, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Michael Asbury who will be introducing our wonderful speaker uh, this evening. Thank you, Michael. Obrigado, Paul, pela apresentação. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for this kind introduction. It is indeed a great pleasure to be part of this conversation with Mr. Marcelo Silveira, a Brazilian artist. He's a dear friend, and he has worked in collaboration in the book that has recently been published by Mary Rossler Books. And today we will be talking about this research and about this collaborative work that led us to publish this book. We'll be focusing on Marcelo's artwork and we'll also delve into how his artwork relates with social engagement. Welcome, everyone. I hope you all managed to select the English channel. I hope you all managed to, again, select the language channel of your choice. If you have any issues, if you have any problems, please send us your question in writing using the chat box and a member of our team will be helping you out. Welcome, Marcelo. Welcome, everyone. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here talking to you. Marcelo Silveira is a Brazilian artist based in the city of Recife, and Gravata in the state of Pernambuco in the northeastern region of the country. He's been around for 30 years, nearly 40, says Marcelo. Oh, I thought you were younger. 
E, 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 e é uma pessoa que eu conheço também, que somos amigos há muito tempo. I've known him for quite a long time. We're friends. We've known each other for 20 years now. The first time we met was in 2003, when Tate Gallery was having its first exhibit of its collection in a foreign country, in Brazil. There was an exhibit in Tomio Take Institute by Tate, and the exhibit was also going about in different places in Sao Paulo, and I was invited to travel around Brazil and meet contemporary artists, and then my work was to report this trip in a conference inside Tomio Take Institute when the exhibit was open. That's when I got to know Marcelo in his art studio in the city of Recife. I think he had just put together this studio back in the day. It was basically an empty warehouse, but it was already used as a meeting point for different artists. Our main meeting was held in his studio in Recife. And I remember that one of the artworks that we saw, named Ropas de Casa, is one of which we're going to debate here today. Okay. So let's begin. Let's start with your traditional work, traditional in the sense that it's artwork that is displayed in an art gallery. I think this is the artwork you are most recognized for, from Marcelo. It's been in different exhibits, in different institutions, in the main galleries in the city of Sao Paulo, and we can see this artwork that is called Nen Dentro Nen Fora, which in a free open translation would mean not inside, not outside. I think this piece shows your relationship with the art scenario, with the art scene, rather. And the art and the contemporary art scene in the city. You're actually in and out at the same time. I wouldn't say you are not in nor out. You are in this ambiguous space somehow. Your work has clear connections with the history of art. As we look at this piece, we can clearly identify relations with minimalism, and some trends of contemporary and modern art. This work also denies this direct relationship with the hegemonic history of art, I would say. Your work also dialogues with with other disciplines, with other art disciplines. At the front, we've got a piece that is called a grande tela or the big canvas where you deconstruct materiality of the canvas, you see glass. So it invokes this idea of science. It is as if we were looking at scientific samples or scientific experiments. And inside those glass jars, you put this great amount of linen. So this is a deconstructed artwork. I'm not sure you agree with that. And at, at the back, we see another artwork it's called Catecismo in Portuguese, or Catechism, where you incorporate images of a book that was a family book that was given by 
members of your family from generation to generation. So this is quite a traditional book and you somehow deconstruct it. You rebuild or you reconstruct different aspects of the book and the way it is printed. It looks like abstract, an abstract painting somehow. So there is this clear conversation of your artwork with art tradition, which I find really interesting. This are called Omolengas. It's a series of pieces. As far as I can see here, you sort of play around with the Brazilian art history that sort of tackles contracts constructivism in a hegemonic way. So here we see this direct relationship with this idea of concrete art and how to manipulate objects. But at the same time, we see that this artwork deny this relationship because of their materiality. Especially if we think of Lydia Clark's artwork, which are made up of aluminum, they're more of industrial objects. And in this case, you clearly use organic matter, organic materials, which invoke the idea of memory. In the catechism, this is also present, the memory of objects that are that belong to the family, that bring this memory from your childhood. These memories that can be constructed and deconstructed. Maybe you can talk a little about that, your memories, when you were a child and how that is connected to the artwork. Well, sure. The memory is the memory of a circus. That was the place I could access in the city of Gravata. That was where I was born. There was a circus in there. And later, I realized that when the circus got to town, People just shouted in the streets, they screamed, saying that the clowns had arrived. There was music, and the circus tent came inside a truck. The tent was fully folded, and I remember I would go to the place where they were going to put together the circus and the tent, and I would watch them erecting the tent. So the idea of a circus inside the truck and the idea of a circus when the tent is up, well, in both situations, the circus is a circus. So if the tent uses a very small space or a very large space, it is a circus nevertheless. And in this artwork, that's the conversation I want to propose with neoconcretism artists in Brazil when they used materials like that. I use, in this case, the bottom of drawers, plates that were part of wardrobes to put together this artwork. This idea of recreating memories and the idea of materiality is something that is transversal to your artwork. You mentioned the fact that the circus was compact and then it opened up. This is the very title of this artwork, Compacto or Compact. As in the previous piece you showed, the articulation is done using canvas. I remember that, now that you talked about it. Now, compact, this piece. Compacto. I try to play with words in Portuguese here. Compacto may mean compact, or it may be two different words. Compacto, which means with a pact. So that's at the center, that's at the core of this work. 
And once again, you are rebuilding something here, rebuilding something that may have been discarded before. You mentioned you used the bottom of old drawers for the previous piece. Here, you use an iconic chair from the history of design, the traditional chair, some Art Nouveau from Michel Tournay. I think that's the reference from 1859, 1859, that was the first chair, the first furniture actually to be produced at scale. So you go back to this idea, you go back to the remains of broken chairs and you rebuild them as if they were drawings in an open space. Well, he thought about the possibility of disassembling chairs so they could be better transported or moved around. So that's also present. Okay, let's move on. We want to talk about social engagement in your artwork. But before that, I just wanted to give everyone in the audience a brief summary of some of your pieces some of your artwork so that people can really know this ambivalence between the artwork, the object within a gallery and this object under a social circumstance, an urban scene. This is another example, which is called pra que or what for. This is almost like a game. Maybe you want to talk about this? This trabalho. Well, this artwork is the result of a conversation I had with a man that used to build cages. Curiously enough, cages in prison birds and to make the object for this cage. He can only use dry wood, wood that would otherwise be wasted. So. He preserves this material to imprison birds, and each of those elements are vessels that are used to feed the birds in the cage. So what I do here is I try to subvert the objects these small vessels. I try to convince people that the more vessels I would use, the less birds would be inside cages. I know this is delusional, but you know, that's what we do. We believe things can change. So this artwork also invokes the idea of a tile, the floor, and the possibility of allowing people to build their own artwork. This can be changed and transformed. This is something like a game. It's called What For? I mean, why do we do things? Why do we put things together? Why don't we do tasks we have to? Why do we leave it up to others to do it? Right, and it references constructivism from a very unexpected perspective you know, the idea of ready-made stuff and so forth. Moving forward, this is called Tudo Certo, or in a free, free translation, this would be Everything is All Right. And it brings about important references for your artwork, memories of a past, memories of your family, subjective memories, memories of ecology, I mean, trees, such as this species that is under extinction and the risk of extinction and the memory of a very important economic sector in the state of Pernambuco. Would you like to say a few words about this artwork, about the origins? Well, well, this was actually part of a tree. This was a trunk that had seven meters height and three meters width. And it was on the floor in the middle of the jungle. 
This tree had fallen maybe 70 or 80 years ago. The trunk was hollow. And then I was invited to be part of the Sao Paulo biannual exhibition. And my proposition was to remove this trunk, which was hollow, from the forest, to cut it to pieces. And then I decided to assemble it in different ways. It had a rounded shape, and then it became flat. And these small chunks of wood could have been larger, but since I wanted to preserve this wood, I had to transport it in smaller pieces. I overlap here this 70 wooden pieces that comprise a 35 square meters area. Now, this wood has a very special meaning, too, for the state economy, right? That's correct. This wood no longer exists in the region because of its physical features. It's resistant to water. And in the rural areas where this wood was taken from, it was used to build vessels, mills, water reels, whatever was in contact with water. I would like to mention José Lins do Rego, an important Brazilian author, and in his book, I found great ideas. Inside sugarcane fields, I found small parts of this wood, stumps, basically, because people would bring these trees down and set fire to the forest, because in sugarcane fields, what they do is that they set fire to their crops, so they could, quote, clean the fields and then cut the sugar cane so that it would grow again the next season. Because sugar cane has very sharp leaves. Since in the region there are many hills, it's quite impossible to use machines and harvesters to harvest sugar cane. And that's why this species of tree no longer exists and this economic sector saw this quick downfall. So I, will, I found these stumps they were all burned. And then when I removed the shell, the husk, I saw that this wood was also fire resistant, which was quite curious. This wood is water and fire resistant at once. So I found these stumps. Many of my pieces were made using those because people who collect wood to be used at home to burn it down in their ovens, in their stoves. These people wouldn't choose to use this type of wood because it wouldn't burn down. All they could get was smoke. So that was quite curious. At the same time, this wood is water and fire resistant. This wood was also used in other pieces of yours. And this evokes other aspects of your work, which is the idea of having a collection or files or mountains of pieces. This is part of the Contemporary Art Museum in Recife. This is one of your first collections with pieces from that Cajacatinga tree. Oh yeah, these were the pieces that wouldn't work. And the ones I thought didn't work, I would just hang them on the ceiling. Well, this idea of not working, quote unquote, is something you learned from one of the artists too. New concrete artists, such as Amilcar de Castro, who would say that his professor, Alberto Guinea, will tell him that whenever you draw, you have to incorporate mistakes to your work. And I find this quite interesting because you transfer this idea from a drawing class 
to more of a broad perspective and action towards sculptures. But I also believe this implies your idea of the way you work and the social aspects that we now we're now going to delve into. Here's another example. It shows your relationship with art collections and this fever of just categorizing everything and having collections on everything. Here we see another artwork that is in Armazem Republica. It's called Armazem Republica or the Republic Warehouse that is going to be referred to inside your work as an important piece for social debates. This is another example. It's called Tudo or Nada or Everything or Nothing. And in this case, the artwork itself is an empty file, an empty cabinet. I'll have to skip some of the slides. We've got some important works. Here we see collage. Not actually collage. These are actually parts of magazines. You sort of tear these magazines instead of making a collage. In each of these boxes, we see a family name. And the title of this work is Boxes of Portraits. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. Boxes of portraits. And then based on these boxes, the magazine was created. It's a quick explanation. The, portrait of, the portraits were created from magazine images, images of magazines that are around. I made this 500 collage, and out of which I selected 90, and I created this edition of a magazine that would go back to newsstands. And in different boxes, you have different family names. These names also refer to different types of wood. This is another example of your work with photography. I find this work quite interesting. Before talking about social work, I think we should talk about this, which is called Irene da Alegria a Gloria, or Irene, from joy to glory. And it defines your relationship between what's local and what's global as an artist. This is as if I'm looking at a self-portrait somehow. These are 14 cards. Can you can you explain this to me? I think I'm speaking too much. Well, I found these postal cards from a lady called Irene. She would publish them in different newspapers around the globe, and she would ask for friends. She would ask if people wanted to be her friend or correspondent. I found these cards nearly a hundred years later, and these were the results of the responses she would get from people. These people lived in Europe, is that right? Oh, yes, in Europe, in North America, in Asia, from different places. At first, I thought this had to do with diplomacy with the Brazilian government, but that was not the case. She would just place an ad, you know, just like nowadays, you would add someone on Facebook. That was pretty much what she did in the past. She had this need of getting to know new people and live with new people. So I call it from joy to glory because she would receive this, these letters in these two streets where she lived. So these were the names of the streets. As far as I understand, you sort of incorporate these cards to a bridge in Recife. 
Oh no, I can't really tell you where this is at. There were 170 postal cards amongst which some I couldn't work with some of them. I could only work with the images. So this background image was created as I put these postal cards together. They were almost falling apart because of humidity, because they were too old. So these ones were the most resistant. You can actually see where this card was, was sent from. So from these images, from these postal cards that were quickly degrading, what I did was I scanned them, I amplified them, and I used a roller pen to work on them. Good, moving on. Here we see how you can incorporate your work, your traditional gallery work into urban spaces. This was the very first artwork I saw back in 2003 when I visited your studio. These are metal structures covered by gold leather. And you called this Ropas de Casa or house apparel. Right. I observed the landless movement tents along the road. And I realized that those tents were not actually homes. For me, at least. Back in the day, those were only structures that were covered up. That was a, a sculpture for me. And these were all built along the road. To do this artwork, I also observed some cover, some covers that protect electrical appliances or domestic appliances in Brazil. I'm not sure in other countries that is the same, but in Brazil, what we do is Let's say you buy a blender and then you sort of you sort of make a protection for the equipment somehow using canvas or using plastic. So that was also a source of inspiration. So these were my two main references, whatever is on the street and whatever is in people's homes, covering up their house appliances. It's also got some relationship with rural growers. I see that this work stems from the transition from local economies. I mean, when big lands when sugarcane production plummeted. And again, this is a reference to your work with wood. Here we see a metal structure inside this canvas as you interact with small artisans and small producers, those who would work in the past in those large farms and at the same time you were inspired by the landless, la landless movement. People who used to work in rural areas, but then lost their lands or didn't have lands to produce or to grow. So again, we see here consequences of the legacy of those major lands. It's interesting that your work stems from these processes. And we see that these symbols also emerge from these transfers. 
and social slash economic changes. Well, I'll just move on a bit quicker. I wanted to leave some time so we can talk about this. Aqui, aqui são, são é, residências que você fez e onde você encontra escolas e grupos dentro da, da cidade. Some situations where you invite schools and groups to interact with your work. Time is going by really fast, so I'll just skip some of these slides. I would like to talk to you about your current work that you're now developing around your studio in the city of Gravata. Can we do that? Oh, sure. This is the front and the back of your studio. This is a drone picture. It's a Gravata is a very small city located in the state of Pernambuco. This is a satellite image. And as we can see, in this region, we see low economic levels. As compared to the regions around it, we see much, many more trees in the neighboring neighborhoods and what you have done in the past years is to establish a very strong relationship with local communities maybe you can talk a bit about this project the estrada da Fel escada da felicidade which would be the stairs of happiness which would be key inside this neighborhood sure. this house slash studio was built 36 years ago. It's a tourist spot, but at the same time, it's been forgotten by the city. People are afraid to go there. So this was one of the reasons why I chose this place. That's why I wanted to build this structure and live with these neighbors who became my friend, my friends. These stairs are a symbol. They connect the lower to the upper part of the city. And this was built in the 50s. People could fund each of these stairs, and if they did so, they were identified as a celebrity, and their name was put in one of the stairs. That is something that bothered me very much, and I think it really bothers those who live in this region as well. In the 70s or 80s, I'm not really sure, Paulo Lucio created artwork that was called Via Crucis. He would go up the stairs and would say every name of these steps. Today, these stairs have been partially destroyed. You can no longer see the names on the steps. And along with Christina Ruggis, that's the lady you see in the picture, and we created this project that was called Você se lembra da escada da felicidade? Or do you remember the stairs of happiness? So we tried to reproduce the answers of these people. There's a group of people who live close to these stairs and a group of people who was part of the construction of these stairs. The result was really curious, really interesting. This work was part of different exhibits. What I used to tell people was that I wanted, I didn't really want to rebuild the stairs. I wanted to rebuild the memory of the stairs. It took me two years to conclude this work. It was divided in three different moments. And then from this work, as I collected images from the stairs, I would use the images that were reproduced by family members because in each of the steps, what people would do was that they would take a picture 
with the person that had funded the staff. After some years, what I'm now doing is I'm developing a different project in the same spot. Maybe to fill a gap. The reason why I went to the neighborhood of Alto do Cruzeiro was because I wanted to make sure people realized that Alto do Cruzeiro is a neighborhood that exists. It's quite contradictory because the same neighborhood is something people remind of, remember of. They say it's a tourist spot, but no one really goes there. No one stops by because they are afraid to. After 37 years, I've never been robbed. The doors are always open. I have a very good relationship with everyone around my studio. So what we're now doing is to actually put Alto do Cruzeiro in the map. We're including Alto do Cruzeiro as part of the city. And much to my surprise, there's been major acceptance dwellers, the population, have really accepted this idea. We have two modules now. Number one, four educational classes on our history. And then another four classes to present the technique and create a map. We're going to be using silk screening to create a map that will be printed on paper and on fabric. We wanted this to become tablecloths, curtains. We wanted to print posters to be displayed around the city. This is another attempt of ours so that we can try to reduce the number of people who say they don't know Cruzeiro. I think at the end, the map will be very interesting, especially once it portrays the clothes of the ladies and the gentlemen that are afraid of the neighborhood of Alto do Cruzeiro. So, in this series of workshops, you're using a moving structure, which refers again to the molengas and to the compact artwork. I mean, erecting and deconstructing the structure. Can you tell us a little more about that? I mean, how is this house going to work? And how does it connect to this project of mapping out your neighborhood? Well, at this point, this structure is being used for our laboratory to store equipment, but the structure was thought of so that it can move around. It is close to one of the walls of my studio, but we're going to build another structure in the future so that we can also use another part of my property. Our idea is to be able to transport those structures so they can be used as cultural sites, maybe museums, maybe a site for cultural presentations in different parts of the city. So if people do not want to come to Alto Cruzeiro, we're going to go to them with this structure. Here we see clothes, what needs to be displayed. I mean, at a different scale, we need different materials. And there's always this idea of continuity in my work. The way we built this structure is the same way people build these structures for the São João parties. 
These are large parties that are held in June. They have smaller structures than this one, and these structures are used to sell um, fireworks, to sell clothes for the party. And in June, everything changes. The whole city changes because of these very large parties that are held. They're called São João or the party to St. John. So the, the whole point here is to have a structure that can be erected and disassembled, that can be carried on a truck. And then we can decide where we're going to take it. We believe this structure may be unwanted in some sites. Some neighborhoods may be expecting a fancy structure but then we'll come with this structure and we can use lands that are just abandoned. And if the owners of this lands show up, then we can just take this structure, bring it down and then move somewhere else. Just playing with the idea of mobility and generosity when it comes to housing. You know, I find this social engagement aspect quite interesting and it shows in different ways in your artwork many of your pieces have been have been inspired by observations of your local community just like ropas de casa is but the work you do with objects i mean you put these objects under social scenes I, I have skipped some of these images. I'm, I'm, I apologize, I have to rush a bit. Your work is displayed in unexpected situations. In this case, you opened up a store where nothing is sewed. The name of the store is Sod de Bonito, or a store only for beautiful people. And the store was open in a very busy commercial street, downtown Gravata. You also invite schools to interact with your exhibits. In this case, we've got a library, but I also wanted to talk about sociability. Sometimes you have theme meetings, thematic meetings, as an attempt to establish network, a network inside different spaces. In cities in the countryside of the state of Pernambuco, where we do not see cultural sites, museums, galleries, and so forth. Strategic. Uh, I think this is quite a strategic approach. I mean, the way you invite these people, people who come from different fields of knowledge. Can you talk about this idea? How do you see this performance? I mean, this happenings, you know, by having meals together that, you know, in this meetings that you organize. Well, this dinner, this meal that we were having together is something that was held once a week for two months. I invited the new people who were discovering the intruder. You know, the intruder was myself. I was just coming to the cities. I had, I had advertised my presence whatsoever. The sponsor of this work agreed with that. They agreed that we wouldn't make my presence public in the first month. I would just sort of invade the city and then create some elements, such as this store, which is called the Store for Beautiful People. And then these people were people who started to make associations. They were like, oh, I saw this wooden sphere. 
a loja. The city. É, I saw this store. Quem é isso? Aí a gente who is this? Who does conversa. this belong to? So e, these people e, who started e, asking e, questions e, were the people we invited for these dinners, escola, and then the number of people started a, to increase. A, a members of schools, members of escola, restaurants, e o, o, and o primeiro momento, eles não, the eles culmination não of all this. You know, we're, in the schools, they were really questioning what we were trying to do. They asked us questions over and over again. They wouldn't understand us. And when that was the case, we would invite these people to this dinner. And then we would explain them what we were doing. The final result was presented to schools. Sometimes there would be 600 students listening to us. That was the case in this one, you'll see in the picture. In the previous example, we had some odd elements. In this case, we see the wooden spheres. The school was being renewed. These groups you see in the picture are actually classrooms. Classes are being taught at the court because the sports court because the classes the classrooms were actually being renewed renovated and at the end culminated in a work that was that involved the whole school they actually created a play around it so this it's all about food in this other project where I traveled to the dry lands of the state back in 2019, we went to Triunfo. Oh, there we go. This is the picture. Everyone is helping us out. No one's cooking for anyone. The idea in these meetings is not to serve people. The idea is to serve along with other people, produce along with other people. Red rice is cultivated in the dry lands of Pernambuco. I didn't know that. You know, I live by the shore. So I didn't know about this type of rice, but this rice is something people eat a lot, but they didn't really know what the history of this rice was. So I did some research. During colonization, this rice was brought to the colony. They fostered its cultivation. And then when they found out about white rice 200 years later, this rice was forbidden for consumption. The state of Maranhão would in the state of Maranhão, they would arrest enslaved people if they ate this rice, and white people would have to pay a penalty if they ate this rice. But now it's still there. What happened was that people would plant this rice in hiding, and the seeds are around until present times. These stories are quite curious because the same rice that was cultivated in Triunfo, which is a very small city, was also made when we launched our book to a different group in Sao Paulo. And in this case, we worked with a privileged group of people in Sao Paulo. There was this one person that asked me, why is rice not green and yellow? I pretended that I didn't hear that, so we just moved on. But at the end of the day, the rice tasted very good. We all talked as we ate. And the idea is to create this type of conversations, create these moments so we can exchange these ideas. As we interact with others, we can establish 
a dialogue and not a monologue. So one hears and one speaks. Sometimes you don't even have to say anything. You can just hear and shut. So this relationship with the other is something of my interest, the idea of exchanging something, the possibility of not just conveying some information to the other, but the idea of actually fostering a conversation and learning about something that you didn't know before and therefore make this other universe possible. Marcelo is the result of such conversations. In the group we have in Alto Cruzeiro neighborhood, I asked people, do you know why I chose this house? No, I told them this long story, and at the end, I told them. This was the neighborhood that made people afraid. People who lived in the city. When I started building this house, when I bought the truck of cement, I never got it. So I complained it. I complained about it. And then the neighbor the neighbor said, you know, I just put the cement inside my house because it could, it could rain. That's what people usually say, you know. But that was not the case. I mean, we have to be open to the world. We can't foster this culture of fear, the culture of closed doors, barbed wire, electric fences, and so forth. Now, speaking of that, speaking of opening up, shall we open for questions? I mean, I had to skip so many things. I've got so many questions I wanted to ask you, but in any case, I think this would be a good opportunity for us to open up for questions from our audience. You know, this is quite weird, this online events, because we can't really see people. But in any case, please feel free to ask your questions. Whatever question you may have to Marcelo, please feel free to ask in writing using the chat. We also have a Q&A button at the bottom part of your Zoom screen. You can use that to post your questions. While you are warming up, I'll go back to some comments I have to skip. Now, the issue with the other, I find it really interesting. When you create objects or collections, this process is also about the way you think about other people. I'm actually thinking about two specific people who were very important for you during your journey as you created these collections. Objects, pictures, and so forth. One of these people is Liedo, and the other one is Maria Rita. And it's interesting. I mean, I'd like to allow you to speak about them because you'll do a way better job than I would. Liedo from the state of Maranhão is someone I knew many years ago. He passed already, but in any case, he would collect everything that had to do with politics, religion, and sex. And everything that had to do with relationships as well. He would do it because he was 
Rebel. He was a fun guy. And it was a surprise for me to see the way he would catalog everything. He had different boxes. He would collect leaflets from politicians. You know those they give you on the streets? They don't do it that much nowadays, but he collected those leaflets for 60 years and he cataloged all of them. Eles tinham, passavam por critérios de, do colecionador. They would ele use era, ele, eu, specific eu criteria ele, from collectors to actually catalog those leaflets. He would establish rules for all of those essa, elements ele, and he established ele, a conversation ele, ele between everything he thought was important, e, namely religion, politics, sex. But he had concrete objects for that. He liked to touch the objects, the pictures, papers. Maria Rita is someone I met years later. She was working in Nara Hussle Gallery in São Paulo. She used to be a cupbearer. She was a server. She had a collection, but she didn't really own those objects. If you ask her, Maria Rita, what about this specific piece? Is it part of your collection? She would say, well, this fits or this does not fit my collection. And that was something that stood out for me. She no longer works for this gallery, but she will send me pictures every now and then. She calls me Mr. Marcelo Silveira all the time. She calls me Mr. She says, Mr. Marcelo, I've got another piece to my collection. So she will take a picture of a piece she likes and she will send it to me. We actually made a video of her. We recorded her talking about the collection. And that's quite interesting. She does not, belong, she does not own the object, but she has this desire. She wants to know and to be a collector. On the other hand, some other people have the object, but all they do is accumulate objects. And they will do that. They will have the object because they don't want to share it with anyone else. This person, I mean, it's someone who's quite despicable. I mean, collecting things is a human feature, but it needs to be done in a healthy way. You can collect things with no space, with no money. This is a good human characteristic. It's about putting an order to whatever you like, to whatever you want, to the flavors you like to taste, to the texts you, write, you like to read, the books you like to have, friends, and so on and so forth. It's a healthy thing to collect things. Now, to quote Maria Rita, some things just don't fit your collection. And if something doesn't fit your collection, it can fit another person's collection. So we need a high level of generosity here. Collectors usually make their collection public. They don't want to have objects for themselves. They will order, they will organize things, but they will later make it public. So this relationship is something of my interest. That's why I like to think about collectors and collections. These are two interesting extremes, extremities, actually. On the one hand, we've got this collector that wants to describe the characteristics of Brazilian culture and categorize them within four or five categories. And then we've got Maria Rita, which is pretty much the opposite. She will create a collection out of nothing. And this is quite a sophisticated 
thought. We got a question by Lucy Orta. She's an artist and a professor from our university. Michael will be translating the question into Portuguese. She says, I'm so happy to learn about your work, Marcelo. Are there examples of these social projects in the book? And if the book has been translated so far? Should I talk about the book? You want to talk about it? Well, there are two versions of the book, one in English and one in Portuguese. When we kick-started our conversations more than six years ago, the main hurdle I faced was to think about how your work could be organized in a book. I mean, you got such a diverse and comprehensive artwork. And this is quite ironic. I mean, to a great extent, your work is about categorizing and organizing collections. But at the same time, your work is quite difficult to be categorized. So the solution I found, and I'm not sure this was the best solution, I believe there may be different possibilities of looking at your work, but the solution I found to that was to divide your artwork according to different sites, to different places, because you look at the concept of place from different perspectives, from the perspective of belonging somewhere, sometimes as a cultural site or as a social space or as a space for symbols. So in the book, we try to categorize according to those spaces, the city of Gravata, the memory of the farms, the collections and files, and your studio in Recife. So these are four spaces, four sites, and therefore four chapters. I mean, these are different layers that overlap, and the very last layer, the most up-to-date layer, is the social trend. It's not a book on social engagement per se, but in this book, we look at your artwork as something that can lead towards that. I'm not sure you agree with me. Oh, I do. Yes. Throughout this time, I have published some small books myself. I've also published texts on other artists. And I did it in a quite straightforward way. There are some specific articles on many of these pieces, the stairs of happiness for one. We see this quite straightforward proposition of creating a relationship with people and negotiating with people. Authorship, for example, in the stairs of happiness, Christina Hughes and I share authorship. But this book, in any case, there are 32 pages to it, comprising nine years. You mentioned six years, but from the very first conversations we had, well, it took us nine years to publish this book. I hope the next ones can be published faster because there was a lot of negotiation involved. 
muitas, muita paciência de Michael, muita so paciência na galeria também. So we needed to be patient. I mean, the gallery Porque folks were patient. Michael was quite patient. We had to leave some things aside. Priscilla, Priscilla our designer, Priscilla was also involved. Priscilla Gonzaga Mas, is her name. Com o livro já é uma curtição, né? So, you know, todo um processo, just by... Né? organizing the book i had a lot of fun because you can systematize the processes that were ongoing so some processes are at a more advanced level some other projects are still at an early stage and that is the case of a book that is to be published for kids in this case, we look at the interaction with the communities in those spaces where I collected food. Workshops and texts will be by these children and teenagers. So there's really a lot of negotiation involved, but I, I feel happy to see that. Okay, Marcelo, we got two more questions. I'll translate them into Portuguese. The first one is by Joshua. Kruzik. We apologize if we mispronounced your name. Here's the question. When trying to bridge the gap and create dialogue between different classes of society through your art, do you take different approaches for different groups? Não, não tem nenhum, não tem diferença. Não, não tem nenhuma diferença de abordagem. Não há diferença em meu approach. Como seres, seres humanos. Eu trato as pessoas como seres humanos. Todos eles. Eu parto do princípio que, para que essa comunicação exista, tem. Eu só acho que, se queremos comunicação na fala, né? To go well, then we need to be interested in listening to what people have to say, and vice versa. So that's the basic principle I use for one or more people to communicate. There needs to be interest. And then something I would add to this question is that we should be held responsible for that. We should include people from as many origins as possible. I don't want to separate these groups of people. I want to actually have them be in contact. That's my responsibility. And I think that's the responsibility of different professionals. We're not here to separate people. We're here to call everyone on board, you know, to be around the same table. That's why we cook. We cook because we want to foster conversations. Where I'm from, we usually say that if we want to have a good conversation, we should kill and cook a good fat chicken. And then you will have long, fruitful conversations. And I think that's up to us. That's our responsibility. That's the way I see it. We have to fight these differences and do away with conflict. Yeah, that's actually what I was trying to mention when I talked about the fact that you create network in places where there are no cultural institutional sites. So you invite different people to the table. You may invite someone from Lisbon, a collector from Sao Paulo, local dwellers who want to talk about this topic and from there something can be created or at least a platform to exchange idea is created for 
and that can be the source of new projects, autonomous projects that can be developed irregardless of your work. Exactly. Deus queira que não chova, or hopefully it won't rain, is a work that we developed. It is actually a circus with no tent. Actually, you see the fabric only around the structure and not on top of it. So it's an uncovered circus. Hopefully it won't rain. That's the free translation of the name in Portuguese. We erected this structure in Belo Jardim in a quilombola or maroon community. That is it. That's the picture of this work. And the previous picture shows the meeting that we held. The other picture also shows this work in a square in Rio de Janeiro. Now, in this region, they hadn't seen rain for many years. And the day we put this structure together, it rained a lot. And it actually brought down the circus. People called me and said, what should we do? And I said, well, just leave it on the floor. You know, all these people sitting around this table full of food are people who are part of the local community that had never been to the Quilombola community. We see the mayor, the deputy mayor, justices, priests, school directors. Most people didn't know the Quilombola community. And this community was located in between two cities. And these two cities, well, none of them wanted to support the community. Like, oh, you don't belong to this city, you belong to the other one. And the other one would say the same. There was another artist, Carlos Mello, that also did some work in this maroon community, the Quilombola community. And now they can't really say that they don't know the community. I think it may be a good idea to explain what a Quilombola community is. Michael says he can't hear the translation. He says, I mean, Aldo is a great interpreter, but we don't know how that is translated into English. Can you explain what a Quilombola or Maroon community is? Well, this is a community of African descendants. In Brazil, we've got many communities like that. Some of them are stronger, some are weaker. In this case, this community is made up of a group of people that wanted to get together. There was a leader, a female community leader. She was trying to bring people together and she was trying to organize themselves. She was trying to tell their story because, you know, even members of the community, the younger folks, didn't really know what their story was. So this is a space where black people, African descent, former slaves would go to, to take shelter. That happened back in colonial times. So that's how these communities were formed, many of which were totally decimated. And some of them still survive up to these days. And this is the case of this community we see. They got so many stories to tell. They needed to systematize those stories so they could fight for this space. They knew that this community was there, but they didn't own the land, which is something quite common here. Great. Let's move on with the questions. We only have 10 more minutes before we wrap up. Another question by Lucy Orta. She's asking if you still produce objects. 
e que ela acha isso muito estimulante, essa, essa conversa totalmente... Who says, uh, I find this conversation really stimulating, especially the movement and placing the object in and out. I think this was more of a comment than a question. She also asks, I wonder about the term no genre public art. É, ela está ela ela tá perguntando se esse tipo de, de arte, no, novo tipo de arte pública, um, é uma coisa nova no Brasil? She ou... asks if this new genre public art is new in Brazil. Or if this is a natural part of what it means to be an artist. Any thoughts on that? You know, this trend towards social aspects and public aspects. Is this a characteristic of Brazilian art? Well, as far as I can see, my role as an artist can only be fulfilled as I interact with the others. In our country, we have very few spaces, very few sites for the arts. So I think we have to go out to the streets. We have to create these dialogues and come up with these types of conversation. That's how I see myself as an artist. It's part of my responsibility, really. And the artwork. I mean, I fund one project with the other. And then networks are created, local networks are created. In the state of Pernambuco, I mean, the city of Recife is quite well integrated to the cultural scene of art, both in Brazil and in other countries. But when we travel to the countryside, we see that in many cities, We've got this social projects to create more engagement. And of course, these smaller cities are outside the art scene. And I believe very few artists from Sao Paulo or from Rio de Janeiro would be interested in developing projects in the countryside of Pernambuco or even in the countryside of their own states for that matter. I think this is not particular to Brazilian art, but there are artists in Brazil that do want to be socially engaged. And this is the product, not of the work they do, but of the relationship they establish with their towns, with their cities. So not as an artist only, but also as a person. I think you are quite well part of this social structure. May it be through the social structure, which is quite devised, you know, high society, that goes to museums and the audience that has probably never been to a museum. Okay, moving on to our next question by Julia. It's going to be hard to translate this one, but I'll do my best, Michael says. I think it's interesting to observe how the more Marcelo's career took off, the more the need to liaise with what was in proximity, let's say through progressively socially engaged and participative practice.
Quer dizer, o que, o que ela está dizendo é que me parece que... Uh, I think what she's trying to say is that as you develop your work, you also want to be increasingly connected with communities and local societies. You already described the meaning and the necessity of such practices, but I wonder if you can retrace how this awareness came out in your work and career path. Awareness, esse, 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 esse estado de ser uh, aparece no seu trabalho, na sua carreira. Um, quais foram os, os fatores, os, os eventos que... que What que te... were, if there were, the factors or events that influenced this turn? Michael apologizes. He says he obviously couldn't do the work that Aldo, the interpreter, is doing so well. He apologizes. He says he massacred the question. Well, what I can say is that I am part of a group. I mean, I was the one person that questioned how things were around me. I was the odd person. I usually disagreed. I wanted to bring more to the table. I'm the only person from my family who works with art. All the others work in rural areas, they work with agriculture, so maybe, maybe the main provocative element was to try to do away with the noise I got from my own family. Maybe that's where it stemmed from, I don't know. Now, this is something we end up developing, whether we want it or not. Art makes us think about the questions we have, the difficulty we feel as we interact with the world. And sometimes we find strength to make things easier so that we can also work as facilitators for the groups to which we belong. For example, I really like this group of people from Alto do Cruzeiro. I usually say that's my land. I'm from Gravata, but I'm also from Cruzeiro. My hometown has no personality. It, it looks like different things. That is not the case with Alto do Cruzeiro. There, people know what they want, they like the place. And my role in the city, and again, this is what engages me, that's my stimuli, is the fact that I, people know what's original, and I have to define what that is. And I have to find the means to stand up and advocate for these options, for these conditions. I mean, no one chooses to be poor. You just get to that position. And we have to come together. That's why I say we have to do things with the other and not by ourselves. It's about convincing the other to execute their work, to stop doing something. So there is this process of convincing people. I think this is the main driver I have, which is to keep on working on our questions, on the questions we have. Well, I think that's a great point, and that is a great way for us to unfortunately wrap up our talk. Our interpreter may be a bit tired, Michael says. 
simultaneous translation is quite tiresome. And I have to say that I'm truly grateful for having him again in our event. This is the first time we hold an event in a language that is different from English at train. But we have already worked with Aldo, our interpreter, in other conferences, and it has always been quite professional. So thank you very much to him. Thank you to Maribel. She's working behind the scenes. She's been leading our webinar. Thank, thank you, Marcelo. It's always a great pleasure to talk to you. We have talked other times, and I hope this is not the last one. And thank you to everyone who spent this time with us. Thank you for sending your question, your questions. Thank you very much. I hope you can also join us in our next train open conversations. See you next time, Marcel. Oh, let me talk about the book. You can order the book in the Nara Rossler Gallery website. That's right. Thank you, Michael, Paul, Aldo, Maribel. Thank you to the university. Thank you to everyone from train. Thank you. Muito obrigado a todos. Let's keep up this conversation. Either in Recife or in London, maybe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. And muito obrigado, um, Aldo. Thank, Thank you. you very it was much. my pleasure. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Fantastic work. Okay, Marcelo. Obrigado. Até a próxima. Até a próxima.